Okay, everybody, once again, Leizade, uh, or welcome. As you go around Ghana, you'll see uh, Akwaba. Uh, Leizade is the Gruni language for welcome, and uh, Akwaba, you'll see, is the Akan tree uh, welcome. So, um, glad to see you back in the house. Glad to see Bomani back in action down here. And um, first, I just wanted to give you just a little bit of background on how I ended up here, because people usually kind of have some idea of what I was thinking. Uh, I've kind of always been, um, you know, my mother grew up, we all grew up in the heavy civil rights movement, black power movement. Uh, my mother graduated from Spelman a long, long time ago, so you know, we we had a lot in our, in our genes. So I grew up not so much uh, seeing Marcus Garvey too much, although I'd hear him, but certainly Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and, you know, all of the things that were going on at the time. So I was raised in that. Has had sessions in the house, you know, where we would have all these young people in there talking about all of our problems. And I was hearing the names Franz Fanon and this one and that one, Cabral. Didn't know who these people were, but this is the, the feeling of the time. We're talking the late 60s now. And so from there, you know, I, you know, like a lot of people went to school and did some other things, but I always kind of had that spirit of what do we need to do for the race. As I got a little older, started reading Garvey. I think he started making more sense to me than a whole lot of other people. Not so much uh, back to Africa as there, you know, they always just kind of put that little line on him. Uh, but it wasn't so much that, it was just the idea that you have to build something of consequence on the African continent if you're going to have power and some dignity moving around the world. Now, people always say, well, you can have personal dignity the way I hold my head anywhere I walk in the world. That's good, and I encourage that, but, uh, you know, people around the world know who has power and who doesn't, no matter how mm -hmm. how big you have your chest stuck out. Mm -hmm. So Garvey knew you have to build something and have a nation uh, comparable in power and sovereignty to the other nations of the world. So that made more and more sense to me as I studied, uh, you know, I was at all of the conferences, reading all the books, you know, our African Senate study. I always felt like, yeah, but we got this huge thing called Africa. We're talking about African, African, Africa, as though we don't have Africa. So we have Africa, and we have this, and of course, as you know, a lot of people are rushing in on us, whether they're Indians and Chinese, Turks, uh, Russians, and of course, the same old characters from Europe, Chinese, of course. Um, but right now, at this moment, it's still ours, you know, and ours to do with what we uh, decide we need to do with it, although of course, you know, we're under a lot of pressure by a lot of people who, you know, uh, implement their agenda. So I'm always in, so that was my sense of urgency, it's like, well, what can I do once I had the Garveyite orientation, what could I do to get back and try to see what we can start building, strengthening ourselves here so that in the future we actually have the kind of power and the geography and the you know land resources population we need to carry this agenda out as opposed to being in the u.s or in london where a lot of people are in the uk you know and it's never in the argument which is with the european american or european european on you know how we fit what they're owed uh justice and the like and then of course they're just killing our babies uh you know unabated. Mm -hmm. So at some point you have to ask yourself, you know, is that just a fool's errand and uh, do we need to really start thinking about building something that can protect us around the world. Mm -hmm. So that's what being in Africa is about for me. Now there's a course you'll, I'm sure you've heard and you'll see and there's a lot of frustrations associated with that mm -hmm. because just as we were taken over there and beaten about the head and shoulders and, and the minds of the whole slavery colonial process has also left a lot, a lot of damage, psychological damage, um, loss in a lot of cases of sense of agency, uh, and just uh, kind of a orientation that says, you know, if you're gonna make it, you gotta get out, you gotta get connected with something that's out, instead of looking within, protecting what you have. I always tell the Ghana, and it's, it's, it's ironic that you're standing in long lines outside the embassy trying to get a visa to get out, and then when you get to the airport, everybody of every other race is coming in. They're lining up to get in, you're lining up to get out. So that tells you something's wrong with what you're thinking. You know? So 
all of that, uh, you know, just requires uh, socialization, mm -hmm. education. Asa Hilliard used to always talk mm -hmm. about one of our biggest problems is we don't, we haven't taken control of the socialization process of our children. You know, and I mean, if whoever is socializing your children is going to rule the day. They're going to determine your future. Okay, you can be sitting right there in front of them, and you can even be using their materials to socialize them for someone else to determine, uh, you know, their future power and soft freedom. So that's what we're trying to do too. We're really trying to focus on the young people. So the reason I did the African Ancestral Wall, if you've seen any videos, I've said it. You know, I was trying to um, go around to the schools realizing that there was very little in the curriculum, nothing really that's useful. And um, it's very difficult, so lots of villages, lots of places to go. So I set up the wall and I've just been bringing the children on field trips. That's helpful, and the other part that's helpful is uh, someone was mentioned in the children, you know, we have our programs every year, so we have, and I, I'm not doing a good enough job of showing people the kind of things young people have been doing here at, at our programs and whatever. I got to get more serious about getting those things up on YouTube somehow. Because we have young children from all of the villages, schools and everything. And we do, uh, sometimes they do dialogues, sometimes they do monologues. I mean, sometimes, I mean, and it's really, really great. And so that's got to get out there. So what I'm trying to say is I want to use this with the young people uh, in this digital age to propagate the idea to other young people that this is who you are and this is what you can do. I was just speaking at a school a few days ago, big school there in Tema, and you know, I mean, the first question is, who are you? And of course, an African child first thinks that's a silly question until you start talking a little bit and you realize they have no idea what they've done. You know, their whole idea of what they have done and what they stand for is basically what they read in the book that was sent down to them from London, and it says Cambridge, Oxford, and you know, and they charge extra money for that. And then every, and according to those, you, 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 I mean, those don't, don't even distort African history, they just leave it out. I mean, they, they don't even give you the, the benefit of, you know, saying, no, that's wrong. They, they don't even do that, they just like, it didn't even exist. So, so anyway, I mean, I can go on and on about that, but until we get control of this curriculum across Africa, across the black world, we're really going to be in trouble. Uh, short of that, we need to be taking other measures to make sure that our stories get to our children, especially in this digital age. So uh, it's a huge task. I mean, it's really, uh, to me, almost unforgivable that 2022, we don't have one or two or three solid African curriculum, mm. you know, in the, as far as I know. I know people who have pieces that are doing things in the U.S., but I mean, you know, you all are teachers. You know how I, my mother was a teacher. I remember how every few years she would come with these, like, three or four stacks of books. Mm. One would be from... Houghton or somebody, I forget the different, you know, the, the, yeah. the people who make books. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of the big names, and they'd have stacks. And so the teachers would be looking at the different, you know, companies mm -hmm. and trying to give the uh, input to the principals or whoever, which one we should choose, you know, for our curriculum. So it's this stack, you know, and that would do it. That would be the same company would do everything. So they would choose one of those. And, but there were already always three or four or five to choose from. You know, and that's what we need, at least one or two to choose from. Say, so, okay, we want this stack of curriculum for our children, K through whatever, and whatever through whatever, and history, math, science. Because it's got to be all of those uh, disciplines, by the way, because I was looking at my son. My son's in eighth grade, his math book, and we were, they were talking about pie. So they had the figure pie, real big bowl on the page, and under it, a big map of, of Great Britain, kind of an old map of Great Britain. And then when you read through, they kind of mention, if you don't know, they just run by that, you know, in ancient Egypt or whatever. 
pie was known, you know, but they didn't really, you know, it's kind of like it was alluded to in ancient Egypt. They're not saying, showing you all of the mathematical equations where they were using 3.14 something, something, and all of these circles and spheres and volumes of cylinders. You know what I mean? And it was all there. And that was how many thousand years ago? But when you read down, they'll tell you about the Greek guy about two or three hundred, two hundred BC, which is thousands of years after Africans were already using pi. Right. And then, yeah, I'm saying, but I'm looking at the picture, and it's a picture of the British map. And I'm saying, how did that come in? Then you keep reading down. Some guy in 1400 something from Wales chose the name pi. He got nothing to do with inventing it, using it, the concept. Like he just, you know, chose the Greek letter pi. That's the designation. So if you're sitting, and this is, you're in Africa, you see this big bowl pie, then you got some scribbling real hard to understand, maybe the word Egypt in there somewhere, but it doesn't register. And then everything having to do with actually, you know, determining pi to more decimal places, and you know, they make it like that was the discovery. You know, just making it, you know, 25,000, you know, decimal places. That, that wasn't it. I mean, Africans were using it for what they were using it for. So basically, um, these are the kind of things that we're getting today in African curriculum. Uh, say nothing of all of this business about the benefits of colonialism, and I mentioned some of that on a different video. All of these things, um, these are, these, and if your children grow up in that, you're just going to have more of the same. In fact, we're going to lose more and more ground here in Africa because people who know who they are are going to come in to take us here. So we have a huge task ahead of us, and uh, we want every educator or even people who understand the purpose and the, the uh, uh, you know, the gravity of the situation in terms of socializing our children. We need everybody on board. But anyway, that's kind of the background for the African Ancestral Wall. I made it for the students, although I'm happy that uh, tourists and other people come. That's, that's always good, especially educators, because you know the children can't educate themselves so so any questions i'm sorry about uh, and, and this area is called new Ningo. it's not really prom 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 is a little bit on that side i was one of the first people out here bomani knows he came out here long ago uh, when i was just starting and um yes sister yes so when you, you talk about your early experiences in this area, uh, remind me of the name again. This New area, Lingo. New Lingo? New Lingo. New Lingo. 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 Did I say it correctly? Yeah, New Lingo. New. 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 Lingo. 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 N-I-N-G-O. No, Ling no, oh, no. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Lingo. Lingo. Lingo with an N. <laughs> you talk about the early stages of having a lot of bush in the area. Yeah. How did you go about clearing that area so that we can be able to enjoy the results or at least see a different view uh, all of I this area? Was, all I cleared was my space here. And a lot of this other people are starting to clear it because they're claiming it. You know, they buy it, they claim it. A lot of times they put walls around and start clearing it. And so, uh, but even a lot of this you see here had been more or less cleared at one time, but this stuff grows right back if you don't have somebody on it. So like yeah, a lot of it's our country and everything grows quick. It grows fast. <laughs> I mean, you cut all that down and come back in a couple of years and it'd be like nothing happened. So, I mean, so when he came, we're talking, it had never been cleared. We're talking the original wow. bush, and I mean, this stuff was high, boy. I didn't even like to walk around in my own place here, because you know, anything could have jumped out of here. <laughs> so, no, I, the point is, I didn't really do the clearing, other than just my area here. And other people have been, you know, cutting and moving and putting up boundaries. So how did you go about it? Did you get contractors? Did you do it yourself? Like, what was the process? Oh, no, I, you know, it had... Well, the first time, you know, we, you wouldn't believe that everything you see has been cleared mm -hmm. by a bulldozer down to the ground. Mm -hmm. So even every, all of these, these trees here mm -hmm. and all of this stuff, they're all, they've all come up since mm -hmm. we've cleared all of that. Mm -hmm. These trees all here are just new. I mean, these are only four or five years. But I'm talking mm -hmm. about some of the bigger trees you'll see in the mm -hmm. back. They've all come up from literally having the whole place cleared off. 
I mean, it's amazing. It's nice. Yeah, so there's no reason African people should be starving in this world any kind of way. Mm -hmm. Anywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. you see all these mangoes and everything. And I didn't even plant them. They just, mm -hmm. mango trees mm -hmm. pop up. Mm -hmm. Are they popping out now? The children, the children come in here and collect them. Mm -hmm. You know, we just let them have it. As soon as they collect them, they're all over again. Mm -hmm. Coconuts. And we haven't planted any of this. Mm -hmm. This is just like, how did that come? Okay. Seed flew in from somewhere. Sister, you had a question? Thank you for sharing. Okay. Yes, okay, how long did it take overall for the clearing initially? Oh, I mean, they've been clear in a few days. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And then I mean, this mm -hmm. two and a half acres that I'm on. How long did it take as far as the construction to get everything built? About how many years? I mean, it's just about your money. I mean, where, where right. we are right it's here, I mean, they could do all this mm -hmm. in six months easily. You know? how, okay, so this was done in six months? Well, no, actually, we did the there. restaurant part first. Mm -hmm. Actually, it wasn't even a restaurant. It was just an area I used to sit up here and write and think mm -hmm. and do my thing. Mm -hmm. Then my wife kept looking. I built a little house here in 2004, so I was out here by myself. Mm -hmm. Plus, I was renting in, in the city, too, actually. And... Um, and then I built this little area here just so I could sit here and look at the ocean and think and write. And then my wife kept looking and said, now I'm turning that into a restaurant. <laughs> so, okay, so then I turned it into a restaurant. And then about 2015 or 16, I put the guest rooms here down there and uh, ended the wall in 2017 uh, because of the frustration with the schools. So, but I'm saying as far as how long does it take, I mean, if I had the money in my hand, I could have built all of this in six months or less. Mm -hmm. You know, now the building you'll see down here that we're doing with the library, I don't know if you all saw one of the videos, we're doing a library, a multi-purpose uh, area and everything. It's a big building down there, and I've been working on that for about three or four years, but that's strictly because I haven't had the money to just do it all at one time. It's taken a lot. And we're lucky we, uh, when Walter Maya came through here, he was also, uh, he encouraged people to do some donations. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's been very helpful. Um, so soon we'll have that in hand and we'll be able to continue working. So yeah, you know, we get it wherever we can get it. I mean, after I was exhausted, then I had to start waving the flag and shaking the bell and shaking the bowl or whatever they call it. We're going to get it because, you know, we're going to have our children on Saturdays down here and we're almost ready for them on that now. And, uh, you know, we're going to do our programs and do our thing. This will be a place anybody in Africa, anybody in Ghana, anybody outside of the Africa, anytime we come here, we intend to have something with substance going on in that building. If nothing else will just be showing documentaries and and Sankofa and all, you know, whatever it is we think needs to be, children should be able to come in here at any time and access these documentaries, access movies, and of course, uh, we're doing all the digital books and everything we can, we can manage. Because you can't really let them take them out because mm -hmm. it's not like addresses and everything that you can just check them and mail them and tell them what to do. So, but we're, we're, don't worry, we'll have it. So available. Now, oh, let me finish. <laughs> I'll go ahead. Oh, uh, one thing. I, okay, so when the teachers normally come, because you know they're following the bridges system and all that stuff. What are their act, reactions when they first initially come here? Because you know they teach in a certain way. Well, yeah, you know, you know it's interesting. interesting. What happens is, is that uh, I try to start with the principals. They call headmasters. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I I can meet a group of headmasters, there may be eighty headmasters mm -hmm. in the room. I'll show them video, I'll show them I mean, pictures, everything. Out of 80, maybe five are interesting, you know, because this is where we are. I mean, even the headmasters, it's like, what's so interesting about that? You know, I mean, they're teaching them British curriculum and everything, and now here I'm going to... So, but there's always some headmasters, a handful that like, oh, we need this, what day can we come? And then when they come, and then their children go out and talk, and then they talk to other children in other schools, and it trickles back up. Right. The parent might turn around and ask a headmaster, how come you haven't mm -hmm. been to this fall? Yeah, well, uh, we're coming. Then they'll call me. So, but the general interest among the administration, the mm -hmm. teachers, and even the 
you know, the whole educational infrastructure all the way up to the top. Uh, they've been miseducated. So, you know, you can't expect them to do what needs to be done when they think they're doing the right thing. You know, and I was pointing out to some of them the other day, this thing in this math, math thing, you know, I mean, the way they were looking at me like, so what was the problem? And I have explained it a few times, okay. Mm -hmm. Hi has nothing to do with whales, mm -hmm. but they got a big picture, and mm -hmm. your children are, are half reading all of that, mm -hmm. you know. So they just see Pi and and Great Britain. Mm -hmm. That's all, and that make the connection. And you've already lost them in terms mm -hmm. of them knowing they had the agency to actually come up with the concept in mm -hmm. the beginning mm -hmm. to solve all of these problems. Mm -hmm. that's you understand? Just so just them, just they're, they're, just they're, you know, so mm -hmm. it's very difficult to, uh, you know, get, you get, them, them? get the teachers and the kids. Where they, and colonize in their education yeah. process. Just like us. I mean, yeah, you can go to teacher. all black schools a day in, in the U.S. and you're not getting all of that much. I can tell you that for sure. Because I, you know, I've had children in the U.S. and Georgia, Atlanta, look at that history. And then that. Okay, regarding curriculum. Yes, ma'am. Do you write curriculum or have you started writing? I've been working on it. Um, not. Uh, as diligently as I want to. I mean, I'm not a, I've never been a teacher educator, but you okay. know, I like to write, okay. and so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pulling together, and I have my children here coming up too, so, you know, I've got pieces of things that I've put together just for me. And other people have, it's not that no one has done anything, it's mm -hmm. just no one has done the full Jesus. thing that, you know, Jesus. we know we, you know, you, you can't, any African child in the world right now, we should be able to come to him, his teacher, boom. Put a stack of books on his thing that we are confident when they read that they're going to feel empowered, mm -hmm. enlightened, acknowledged, mm -hmm. sense of agency, pride in Africanness, and all of that. And you know, and put the rest of the world in whatever context we decide to put it into. Right. Today, we, I, I mean, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of EDDs we have. And I, don't, I, I hope you don't have Oh, one. no, I got a PhD. Okay, well, whatever. But still. It is, but, still but you know what I mean, EDD. Right. Because that's some specific. And half yeah. of our black EDDs um, have specialized in curriculum. Yeah, right. You talk to them all the time. EDD, you know, I specialize in African. I express that curriculum. curriculum. Let's see, well, where is our curriculum? Mm -hmm. They don't know well, so that you know, I specialize in Their tweaking curriculum. other people's curriculum. Exactly. Yeah. Well, no, that's, that's not. We need specialize in Karik. You know, Asa Hillier. You know, oh, yeah. was trying to start with this. You know, um, I forget the baseline, uh, Portland baseline essays and all that. But you know, that was just to start. It didn't, didn't. You know. Because I just started. Because um, I'm going to be teaching entrepreneurship and business courses. And this particular school don't have curriculum. They don't want to use the established curriculum, so I have to create the curriculum. Well, that's great. And so, yes. But that's more along the business line? Yes, not yeah. international business. Yeah. 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 So my to... focus is going to be, you know, on the content of the Africa. Yeah. Because I feel that the students need it. Because yeah. they know Caucasian stuff. They just don't know Yeah. And where, where, where are you? This is in North Carolina. In North Carolina. Yeah, because I moved from Atlanta. To Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. Are, are you from Atlanta? I no, no, not originally, but I stayed in Atlanta for over twenty years. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I. Very yeah, so you know, Atlanta. you know, my daughter went to yeah. high school in uh, Douglasville. Oh, yeah, I stayed in Douglasville. From Douglas Douglasville. County. Yeah, yeah so, Douglas uh -huh. County High School. My, yeah, I was my parents were living County. in. Yeah, yeah Paul, yeah, my parents were living in Lithia Springs. Uh -huh. My mom was in Douglasville. And I looked at all of that, you know, and I was running back and forth from Ghana to there for her whole school until she graduated and went off to college. And, um, yeah, I can tell you, I can tell you, line, chapter, and verse was in them books. Yep. And, uh, you in the black Mecca in Atlanta, and this is what your black children are learning. Yes, and I don't let you go to a comedic school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I taught at one of those, yeah. and it was all black. Yeah, yeah well, even the curriculum. And thank goodness we have that. But even the mm -hmm. curriculum, that's what I like to see. Yes. Exactly what does that look like? Is that sometimes it's a hodgepodge of stuff. Mm -hmm. We need that stack. Boom, here it is. Yeah. And we can multiply that by thousands of schools if they want it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so anyway, we're, 
We're gonna get it done though, because we have to. There's no, there's no way around it. And we have so much to do, and uh, and I hate to say so little time, but mm -hmm. it is so little time. We don't have a lot of time. We have so many pressures. I mean, everything from you know how the the world is realigning right now in terms of power. You know, that's all going to mean more pressure on us as people try to establish their power in the world and their blocks, new blocks, new alignments, climate change, you know, disease. We got so many pressures on us, say nothing of our own miseducation, that we're running out of time, but we'll get it done. Yes. So you mentioned mathematics, and my question is, is how can those who live in the, in the diaspora, um, African those who are descendants of African slaves, how can they get involved with teaching mathematics to the young people who may come to your program? If they're in the U.S.? Anywhere in the U.S., the Caribbean, well, what would, the U.K., anywhere well, outside of Africa. I mean, obviously, I think people are, people are doing things online. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I should know better who is, but I know there's some brother is doing a real good math curriculum online, you know. Uh, so you have to search around this. People are doing things online. Uh, here in Africa, we need the schools. Now, you know, I, I, if I were a little younger and, and a little more organized, uh, the building I'm building over here would be starting off being actually being a school. Because like, for instance, here in Ghana, a DPS is an Indian school. I don't know what D stands for. I think it's Delhi something. <laughs> I'm not sure. But, but the point is, there's an Indian school over here. And I mean, you see their buses coming from way across everywhere else. And you know, that's just like getting to be the go-to school. They're expanding by leaps and bounds. And they're teaching Hindu, you know, and, and English and Hindu and French, whatever. And I look at that and I know my children are of age to go there, but I know other people whose children are there, and they're not getting anything special. Mm -hmm. It's just in our minds, ooh, the Indians and math, ooh, 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 they're all running down. And this is the way we think. But the point is, I can guarantee, and then this I want to make sure is on camera, anybody, you know, like from Los Angeles, we had the Marcus Garvey schools, <coughs> Marcus Garvey school. And they outperformed all of the white schools from Beverly Hills to, to Laguna Beach, you know, I mean. Just with Onion Palmer, with no money, to, even the, even the, most of the teachers that he recruited weren't even, a lot of them didn't even have bachelor's degrees. I mean, he just tried to see whether or not they had love for black people and then we'll do the rest. And all of them, and their schools year after year after year after year outperformed the rest. But what I'm saying is something very similar to that a Marcus Garvey school or you know something like that uh, here in Ghana the Ghanaians would come to it it's not like they're just gonna go oh, you know uh, I mean if you're getting that performance and you're outperforming these other people they're gonna be there you know so that if it's a quote-unquote African-American or you know American African started or sponsored or organized institution and it's outperforming these other ones that they have, whether they're Indian and you know Chinese are coming next, uh, and, or any of these other pro they will come because they're about you know performance. Who's going to outperform who? And if you have that thing and it's outperformed, they'll, they'll you know. So it's a it's a serious opportunity for some people who want to put some money together, put them their minds to it, and actually start an African centered school in Africa with the same standards that we have, you know, um, on some of the schools we have there in terms of performance. We would just, they would do fine, you know. I mean, we talk about colonial mentality and all of that, but but don't get it confused. These folks, if they see that school is performing, they will be there, and they'll drive right by that Indian school to get to yours. But we have to, you know, know, first of all, that we can do that that it would be successful and uh, then the kind of people who do that should get about it. Long, you know, I was a lecture inside the answer, but it's something that's always near and dear to me. You know, I'm like, we can do this. You know, me, I personally, you know, I can't keep up with 
anything. So if I'm trying to keep teachers and this and this, I would be a mess. But people who would do that administratively, they could make it make it work. Thank you for answering my question. Okay, yes. So, anything else, brother? Everything cool? I have a question. You mentioned that you would sit up here and write. What kind of line of writing would you do? That's interesting. What I was doing at that time, even though I like more political kind of writing, um, I wrote 100 stories because my idea was I'm going to write these stories for young people. And they were kind of like short stories. And then what I did is I um, read them all with my own voice. And then, then I went and found people who voice over all the characters. So this took several years, but I really enjoyed it because that's not the kind of creative side that I've ever really had a chance to employ, you know. And so it's Marcus Garvey Cubs. There's some, someone, um, you know, I don't keep up with them. I put it out there in the beginning and, and I gave most of it away. I sold a lot. But this, out there today, my sister's telling me that somewhere on YouTube, you can go to Marcus Garvey Cubs and somebody's put all those stories on there for free, which is okay with me. Now there's some other people who are trying to get it through Amazon and some other, and that's not me. I just came up and saw my stuff on Amazon. So somebody out there, I guess, is trying to profit. I ain't even trying to chase them down. I'm just like, if, if this thing can get out there and propagate, I ain't mad at them, but they're free. Uh, the audio, they're all audio stories. The idea being that people should be listening. Children should be learning to listen, which is what I used to do with my daughter. And they get those listening skills, and they can do anything after that. So that, that's what I was writing. A lot of work, a lot of labor, a lot of love, and it's out there somewhere. But I, I realize you can't get them here in Ghana. If you, if you go on Ghana, YouTube, Marcus Garvey Cubs, that YouTube, it doesn't come up. The thing will come up, but you can't do anything with it. But if you're in the U.S. and you open it, you can, all of the stories are right there to, to click. So check that out when you get a chance. And give it to your children. We, we give it to the school students of the school. The problem we're having, though, is that now, when I wrote them, I was thinking, oh boy, these children are going to sit down and listen. That's before everybody had a phone. Now if it's longer than TikTok, they're like, next, you know. So, and that's just not the students, by the way. That's all of us. Mm -hmm. really, well, you know, yeah. a very short attention span. Okay. You said that was not your original creative commission. So what was the thing that you were doing originally, or you prefer to do before you got into the Well, I like writing, uh, and I actually wrote a book back there called Seven Steps for Black Reemergence. And then I write essays and here and there and articles for different things, you know. So it usually has to do with, you know, Pan-African politics or African nation building ideas or, you know. And how did you come by that? Is that an avocation or something that you did for your livelihood? Oh, no, no. I, I didn't do it for my livelihood. So, but yeah. livelihood, when I was in the U.S., I actually used to work in the aerospace industry. And, uh, but you know, I didn't leave with the retirement and all of that. I'm one of these people that's always moving. So I'm out here and still moving. You know. but, uh, so, what did you say? You went to school at? Where I went to? The school, college. Believe it or not, I went to the Air Force Academy. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if you all know. You're stationed where? know what that is. Like OTS, Officer Training School. Why you rolling that? Well, I mean, you know, because people want to get into the Air Force and West Point Air Force Academy, but you know, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. You just don't have to, you know, you come out as a quote, as a lieutenant, you know, all yeah, of that. I was accepted which for is officer's training for Air Force after my first degree, and me in military is not. It's a living. It's a living if that's what you want to do. Well, I'm just yeah. something I'm doing. Some folks don't see me that well. You know, I, <laughs> I, I talk to them. Yep, same thing. So I know I don't have problems. But I already know where I'm going. And and in in the military, especially in the officer group, but just in general, they have a way of screening along the way. When you're a junior officer, 
you know, they're all kind of little, you know, they 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 try to get to your to your politics. And they'll put things out there and say, and then if you ain't popping and locking the right way, you know, you you just not gonna be moving up. And now you can't tell someone who moved up that they was popping and locking, but <laughs> if you weren't popping and locking, you weren't moving. So just a, like we always learn to play the game, you know. But but game. but uh, you know, I don't want to say in its defense because I don't know. But the military, at least, it's a little more egalitarian in that you know you can get these promotions to be colonels and generals and the rest where you wouldn't get in in other places in society. But then when you look at the overall structure, that whole structure system is still subordinate to the people That's who are making right. policy right. for their economic benefits. So at the end of the day you're still um, you know a high, high class mercenary. You know, they got a guy, uh, Smedley Butler, you know, if you ever look him up, he's a highly decorated, the most highly decorated general, I think, at the time, you know, in the 50s or what have you. And, uh, but then one day he just said, you know what, I'm going to tell the truth. He wrote a book called War is a Racket with Smedley, General Smedley mm -hmm. Butler. And he told you right there, look, I, I was just a high class henchman for this bank and I was a high class hit man for this company, you know, that's all I was doing. And uh, very seldom you get someone at that level telling that kind of truth. And, and the world is already, you know. But anyway. But you um, accumulated some, some skills and processes and procedures that help you do what you do now by being an assistant. Discipline, uh, some things. Whatever you like to say about that. Well, uh, to be honest with you, I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, I didn't have to be. In, you can be in any system. You can be in an educational system. You can be in a, a corporate system. You can be in a military system. If your desire is to do a certain thing, then you'll use. You'll pull out something from wherever it is to do it. You know, so. I wouldn't necessarily say, uh, oh, being in the, because most of the time being in the military, the discipline and everything, by the time you get through doing all of that, you recognize that it's not to your advantage to go into something like this, or even to advocate something like this. So what happens is after you spend 25 or 30 years, you know, quote unquote, playing the game, and then you come out and you are the game, you know what I mean? You, you, you're not getting ready to do too much. Out of it, that's what 25, 30 years of that does for you, good or bad. Uh, but nothing is 100. percent There's always leakage. Some people know how to take all of their training and still do something good. You know, you look at people like Geronimo Pratt, who was in the army in Vietnam, right? He pulled all of them skills and went out and did something. You know, so we do have people who take those skills and go do things with it for the people. But um, that's not the norm. Absolutely, we have those people, man, like a Bomani time, but modern day Navy tactician. Mm -hmm. you know I'm saying, using all the finest tactical energy that I've learned in the US military, US Navy when I was uh, 18 years old to now. So that stuff is good. I yeah. like what you say about Ger Geronimo Pratt, man. A general in the revolution, man. We know, I, I grew up in a movement that's learned about people like himself and they inspire us. So we got to be the next generation. Yeah, you just have to know what you want to do. Once you determine what it is you're trying to do, you use anything anywhere to, to help move that along. I know we come from the, the America where literally, we have literally the foundation of everything that we need. We just gotta like utilize it. And I'm even learning certain, a lot more things. And I even was talking to my sister, Dr. Austin, and she was giving me some good advice on certain things and, and things like that. So we just gotta really share the knowledge of how to use the system to build what we need. But I think, I think, one of our problems is we're not, you know, back to Garveyism. I don't think, you know, we throw the name Garvey around a lot, you know, but we're, I don't think we're really, really focusing on the key concept, which is we have to build something of power on the African continent. Absolutely. If you have to redefine, reconfigure the whole thing to do, that's what you have, whatever it takes, that's what you have to do. And if you don't do that, 
Yeah. In all of this, I'm seeing something about foundational Black American. Oh something. man, these people are wild, man. Yeah, all kind they're of. They're more dedicated to America. Is, AD, well, I can tell you what it is. A D O S, which is at. Yeah, A does. American descendants of slaves. Well, I think they use the word American. Yeah, I think they do. And all this kind of stuff, I can sympathize with it, I understand it, but it's not taking you anywhere. Yeah, because unless you're trying to build a future in Africa, you're not really moving anything because we're so limited in America. Like, like if you talk about getting 50 acres and building a black power town, who's going to let you do that in America? That's not happening. But you can do that in Ghana. Yeah, and we have seen the history of that too, the history, so we know, we know what time it is. So I'm telling people like, literally, you know, you know the play, uh, literally the, the field of operation, or I'm trying to find the right word, the, the movement is here in Africa, you have to get things in place. So that's what we've been doing, family, and my brother right here, great representation, I can literally just remember being here in 2008, there was nothing else here. I'm, I'm, I'm always looking at it like, wow, and I realized that the thing to do is to get land and develop it and build your, your empire from ground up. Well, there's so many things you can do. I, you know, I think we have to, you can be in America, there's, there's, there's people in the U.S. who don't, can't leave for, for good reasons. Right. You know, you have family obligations, you know, you're in debt, you know. You, yeah, it's all yeah, kind of, the, money, oh, the, the money does not write. Or, or, you know, no, I mean, just, you know, even health things, whatever the case is. You know, everybody is not just can't pick up because it's expensive. You move here, you got to make a living. You know, you got to do things. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying this curriculum that we're talking about, mm -hmm. you don't have to be on African soil to write that curriculum. You can do that right there in New Jersey, Atlanta, mm -hmm. Buffalo after the massacre. You know what I mean? I mean, wow. whatever yeah. the case yeah. is. I mean, that yeah. was a, probably a yeah, case. Yeah, sick, man. But I'm saying, you know, we can do that anywhere. There's a lot of things we can do to build what we need, to help to contribute to what we need here on the African continent. And you can be anywhere and you can be in Jamaica. There's no one stopping us once you have that idea because there's a million things we need. You don't have to be sitting here to get it. But at the end of the day, um, uh, the majority of black people in the world are in Africa. And you are going where the majority of black people are going. You might think you're going somewhere else. <laughs> Because you got a multicultural this and that and the other, and yeah, lovely. But at the end of the day, the bulk of black people are going where these Africans are going. If we're not going anywhere, you're not going anywhere. You might not believe it right mm -hmm. now because they've taught you about, you know, mm -hmm. but trust me, nobody in the world looks at you in America and says you're <laughs> going where the white folks go. That's not what they think, and they like, you're an African. If you don't know where you're going, that's your problem. <laughs> But you're going where we going. And if we ain't going nowhere, you're not going because you got to have land, population, and resources. This is the only place you have. You have, you have everything Everything here. else, you have to rely on someone else who has those things. So the good thing I want to add, add to that is literally the connection that we have to keep because now that we talk about that most people in America are not going to leave. That's so right. now we have to use them as a foundation to where we can build a connection and keep the bridge going. Whether it's uh, import, export or trades or just anything you can work on. So trying to work both sides of things. So even just building my energy well, back I, in America yeah, to you where... You have to be careful with those words now. You know, you're not using anybody to do anything. Right? I mean everybody, we're in this together. All I'm saying is once you have the idea that we have to build something and like I've been saying, we're going to even have to redefine what that something is. Mm -hmm. You know, these Berlin uh, things that they laid down are killing us. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know nobody likes to talk about that, but we, these are things, if you're talking about viable nations and polities, you have to talk about things that can work together and produce. Right now we don't have those. So all of that's all part of it too. Mm -hmm. but, <clears throat> but even the trade and the back and forth we're talking about, if it's all done within the context of their controlled institutions, you're still going to be in trouble. Uh, if you still have to, you know, and I mean, we can go on with this. But the point is, uh, everybody, read Garvey, get it in your mind that somehow something has to be built on the African continent. Start thinking about what it is you can do toward that end, whether it's training, whether it's materials, whether it's uh, you know, curriculum, like we say, or whatever it is. Start thinking about that, and then start thinking also about what you could do if you were here, or what your children could do. And um, I think 
but keep reading garbage because I think we get off of that track and then we start getting into we're going to out entrepreneur the Chinese. Well, <laughs> you got to have. Well, no, it's not that you can't do it, but not in the system they're controlling, right. or not in the right. system that the Europeans control. You just got to be your system, you know. So you're not going to buy them out. You know, you're just going to build your competing system and then operate on your terms of power. Key word you mentioned is compete. So. so anyway, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's but the, the good we, thing about we it, we have people, things, we have people yeah. everywhere, so we just we just gotta just do a global yeah. operation and and you know make it work and make you know Africa the foundation of where everything you know really flows and you know use our people in the best positions to do other things. But yeah, I mean, like I said, if you can't, you know, I, I wouldn't advise everyone to run to any one country or another. We got yeah. a lot of Africa, yes. you know what I mean? Yes. Don't feel like you all got to run no. to, you know, I know this is not helping the tourism, of Ghana, but don't feel like you got to run to Ghana or yeah. run to this one or run to, no, so, you know, think strategically. Yes. Think strategically. You may look around Africa and say, this is an area that if we can, if we can get certain things in place, and once again, I'm always thinking with the youth, it's going to have more impact than this place if we did it than that place, you know? I mean, some of these are so Christianized that, man, I mean, Ooh, now you yes. got to figure out what to do there. Yeah. We got all kinds, of, you know, Dr. Ben, all of these people have been doing all this work all this time. These things need to be uh, packaged in ways that our children, you know, can understand. I was at the same thing I was talking and the children asked, someone stood up and asked, uh, is Jesus white? This is one of the children or black or white, mm -hmm. you know. Now, those of us who, you know, read on some of these things know it's much deeper than that. Yeah. It ain't like, you know, you don't just say, oh, you know, he's black. You know, he's a, well, it's, 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 the story is much more complex than that. So you have to, but at that point, they just want a yes or no black or white answer. And you have to say, it's not yes or no black and white like that, what it is. You know, and I just try to allude to the fact that, you know, these stories and this mythology has been here a long, long time before this Jesus character that they brought to you ever existed. And you have to know from whence some of that comes. Well, the children don't have any basis from which to even start to understand that. So that's our fault. So you're sitting in New Jersey and you know that needs to happen because you've been reading philosophies and opinions. Then you start packaging that in bites that our children can begin to understand from bottom to top anywhere in the world. So there's all kinds of work to do. Because I tell you, the religion is, is man, it's serious. Yeah. Because anytime they got you singing and crying, I was sitting on a tro tro the other day, I mean, a few weeks ago. He come in from my shama, and I was tired. It was the last tro tro leaving, and brother got up, and we were all going out, coming back this way. He started preaching, which they do a lot. And then he started singing. And then he looked around and people are joining in. About halfway through the trip, you know, everybody's swaying and singing all of his Christian songs in tree, you know. <laughs> you know, or God sometimes, you know, whatever it is. And you realize, uh, you, you look around, everybody sucked up into it. Not everybody, but, you know, at least 60 or 70 percent of the people. Mm -hmm. Right now, you know, you're a Christian, you look at me and say, Well, what's wrong with that? Well, these things are superseding your own core belief systems that you had long before they came. Indeed. And so, Indeed. in your mind, if I got a six year old boy and you show me a picture of this European Jesus and you say he's the son of God, if he's got any logical capacity, he's going to say, Well, the father must look like the son. You don't expect to see a white son and a black father. So you don't have to even say about God being white. So now God himself or herself, but it's always a him, is a European because he's the, son, he's the father of this person who we see in the flesh. And now we're learning all of the song literature. We're crying. I look around. I mean, some people had tears coming down. It's just on the way to the, the end of a hard day's work. You're not going to win. No. no. You, you just can't. <laughs> So all of these things have to be addressed at every single level. And uh, I'm 
you know, I'm already in trouble, you know, because I got these videos out. People already know that, you know, but, you know, what? It is what it is. It is what it is. So, that's, uh, that's kind of where we are. Anyone else, brother? You haven't said anything. <laughs> so he's trying to keep your job, man. <laughs> 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 like, yeah, hey, man, I only got to do a few more years of retirement. Yeah, I can't be out of here. Also, anybody in time, you have any questions for Jerry? Let's try to get some questions from others. Uh, in terms of, I, I was hoping my man, my man Craig might come by today. I don't know. Yeah, that's fine. Craig come by. We can also by after after we can maybe check out his property. Yeah, when we get through. The one that's in the development and stuff? Yeah, yeah. That's Craig too? Norman. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's yeah. got it started. You know, I mean, it's always. Uh, so marking other people's developments also. Showing people right. that I'm not a hater. I love everybody. Yeah, Let's just keep this going. Yeah, yeah. yeah because some people may like prom prom. Some people may like Winterbuzz. They may like Cape Coast. They 